After learning the basics of paging, let's now look at a minor variation to the basics. Demand paging. So what is demand paging? Essentially, it is a paging where pages are loaded only on demand. That is only when they are needed. So let's recall the paging basics. Both the logical address space and the physical RAM are partitioned into blocks of equal size. In the logical space, these blocks are called pages. In the physical RAM, these blocks are called frames. A page table is used to map page numbers to frame numbers. With demand paging, we don't have to load all the pages at once. This will be a benefit for large processes that require a significantly large number of pages to load their process image. So, if a process requires 100 pages, not all these 100 pages have to be loaded in RAM. Only those actually needed or referenced by the process are loaded. As a side effect, a large process will not monopolize all the available RAM in the system since it is possible to allocate only a fraction of the actual process size, the operating system would be able to manage a higher number of concurrent processes in the system. Later, we will also see that pages can be swapped in or out of the RAM. But how is demand paging visible to implement? Well, let's compare to how we humans read a printed book. So when you say, I'm reading a book, how do you actually read the book? Do you read the entire book at a time? Or do you read one page of the book at a time? Or even, do you read one word in a page of the book at a time? So apparently, human eyes are trained to read only one word at a time. When we humans read a printed book, most of the time we will have only two pages in front of us. We flipped to the next page on demand, only after we reach the end of the current page. So this is a similar analogy of a computer running the instructions of your process. Your process may have thousands of instructions inside its code section, but like human eyes, the CPU can only execute one instruction at a time. Therefore, out of the many pages of code, only one page containing the current or the next instruction needed to reside on the RAM. This is essentially how demand paging works. Just a refresher on the details of virtual address for paging. Let's say the logical address has the following two parts, k bits of page number and m bits for offset. The total number of pages would be 2 to the k and the number of bytes per page is 2 to the power of m bytes. Giving the total amount of memory in the logical space of 2 to the power of k plus m. The important lesson that this page gives you is understanding the relationship between the address format, so the address format is shown here, the number of bits for page number and the number of bits for offset, the page size, the number of pages, and the total amount of bytes in logical space. Just remember that the number of bits in the offset determines the page size, and the number of bits for the page number determines the number of pages in the system, and consequently, the number of bits in the logical address space, the total number of bits in the logical address space, determines the amount of logical address space available to any process. Now let's see how paging works for two processes, red and green red with five pages and green with three pages in their logical address space. 
recall that each process must be associated with its own page table. Red's page table has five entries and green page table has only three entries. Assuming page size of 2K, remember that 2K is 2 to the power of 11. So 11 bits are used for the offset. Red uses 10K total, 5 times 2K. And green uses 6K total of logical memory. On the right side of the screen, you see how memory frames are allocated to both green and red. The physical memory has a total of 10 frames, 0, 1, all the way to 9. And some of them are labeled with who owns the frame. The OS must keep track of which frames are free and which ones are allocated. This is where the OS frame table is used for. With 10 frames total in the RAM, the OS frame table has 10 entries. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. If you inspect the RAM, the first frame, frame 0, is allocated to R2. So the first frame is owned by red and the third frame of red is allocated into frame zero. So a similar information is found in the OS frame table. So frame one and two both are allocated to green so frame 2 is the second page of green and frame 1 is the third page of green. Frames 3 and 8 are free. Now if you inspect the red page table, the first entry shows number 6. This tells you that the first frame of red is allocated at frame 6 in the physical RAM. And number 9 here tells us that the last page of red is allocated at frame 9 in RAM. Although we see two processes in here, but the diagram shows only one page table based register. This is the case on a real hardware. Your CPU has only one page table based register. On context switching, the page table based register must be reinitialized to the address of either the page table of red or the page table of green, depending on which one is about to run. So the two page tables are incomplete. You should be able to fill in the missing six entries, missing three entries from here and three entries from here. So you can use the information from the RAM and combining the layout of the two processes to fill in the missing six numbers. Another important lesson from this page is process isolation. At the bottom of the screen, you see three short questions and a blank space to fill in. And I notice that the first two questions ask you two logical addresses, like one from red and one from green. The two logical address looks the same, page number two and offset 350 for both of them. But one address is issued by red and the second address is issued by green. Of course, you can see from here, page two of red goes to frame zero and page two of green goes to frame one. So although the two logical addresses are the same, but the information in the page table guarantees that 
the red pages are isolated from the green pages. So let's pause here for a short exercise to answer the three questions at the bottom of the screen. So given the same logical address 3008, but we have different page size of 4K, 8K, and 1K, and your job is to determine the physical location of the logical address 3008 depending on the page size. With the MMU dependent on page table to perform address translation in hardware, every fetch of instruction or data issued by your process will incur two memory references, one to access the page table and another reference to fetch the actual data or instruction. With memory access time typically 10 to 100 times slower than the CPU speed, this extra overhead may cause the CPU to stall longer. To solve this issue, we can place a high-speed cache between the CPU and the RAM. So the high-speed cache is called Translation Look Aside Buffer, TLB. It is like a hash map but implemented in hardware. As you may have learned in data structure course, a hash map has two parts, key and value. For paging hardware, the keys are the page numbers and the values are the frame number associated with the page. Recall that paging hardware essentially replaces page number in the logical address with the associated frame number to produce a physical address. When we look at the improvement made by TLB, we have to consider two different cases when the data is found in the cache or when the data is not found in the cache. We call them TLB hit and TLB miss. This illustration shows the internal MMU paging hardware, which has been enhanced with the high speed cache or HASMAP TLB. Recall that the ultimate goal for the MMU is to translate logical address into physical address. The logical address contains the page number and offset, and the physical address is the frame number and the same offset from the logical address. Without TLB, the translation path is shown by the red arrow at the bottom of the screen. The TLB itself is a high-speed cache that stores a pair of page number and frame number. When TLB is present, the MMU hardware will perform a parallel search to find a matching key page number P by comparing it with all the key values found in the TLB. In diagram, we label it as step number one. When a matching page number is found in the TLB, this is what we call a TLB hit, the associated frame number is used to replace the page number and the logical address with that frame number to generate a physical address. This is step number two. When after searching for the key, no matching page number is found, this is what we call a TLB miss, then the MMU hardware will continue like what we learned before. So the page number will be used as an index of the page number to get the matching frame number for that page. And at this point, we have to update the TLB so that future references to the same page number will be found in our TLB. And this is shown as step 3B. So the incoming page number and the frame number found in the TLB will be inserted into the TLB. So next we will try to determine the effective memory access time when TLB is used in our MMU hardware. So the two important points on this page is understanding the behavior without TLB and with TLB. Without TLB, your MMU hardware will always perform two memory references. With TLB, 
and then you will see two different cases in case there's a TLB hit of course we know the TLB hit after the MMU reads data from the TLB from the cache but then after we found the matching key in the cache the memory hardware will perform one access to the RAM to fetch the actual data or instruction but when there's a TLB miss then your memory hardware will have to perform two memory references one reference to the page table and the second reference to fetch the actual data and instruction but also in addition the memory hardware has to update the TLB to insert the new pair of page number and frame number so on most CPUs the TLB size is about 4k entries so let's look at some numerical example assuming we have a TLB hit ratio of 80% and the time to access the TLB is 5 nanosecond and the time to access the RAM is 100 nanosecond so then how do we know the effective access time for every reference to our memory so we can do the calculation in two different ways so the first technique is to look at the two cases 80% of TLB hit will result in one TLB access and one memory access and because 80% of the time we have to perform TLB and RAM access so the total amount of time will be 0.8 from 80% and 5 plus 100 but in case of a miss which is 20% of the time we do have to access the TLB one time but in addition we do have to make two memory references so then the total cost will be 20% 0.2 times 5 nanosecond to access the TLB and 200 nanosecond to make two memory, memory references so the total will be 0.8 times 105 plus 0.2 times 205 or the other approach to solving the problem is that we know that on either case regardless whether it's a hit or a miss we always access the TLB at least one time so then we know in that case because the TLB is always accessed then we do have to spend 5 nanosecond for the TLB access and then the difference between hit and miss is that on the hit you make one memory reference that will cost you 0.8 times 100 nanosecond but on a TLB miss you need to make two memory references that will cost you 0.2 times 200 and again if you total the number you will get the same result either you are doing it this way or the second way so let's compare with TLB the effective access time is 125 nanosecond but without TLB we know that the memory hardware has to make two references every time so that means without TLB the cost is 200 nanosecond so that we, indeed we see TLB will make the access time shorter